Today on CyberWork, Kelly Conlin of Jamf joins me to discuss all things Apple security. In this episode, you'll learn about securing devices across multiple OSs, the hidden in plain sight Apple security Bible, and why Kelly's mom isn't allowed to use the 15-year-old Mac laptop Kelly is still hanging on to after all these years. Remember that CyberWork listeners are eligible for a free month of InfoSec skills by going to infosecinstitute.com skills and using the promo code CyberWork when joining. That's 30 days of free security courses, hands-on cyber ranges, skills assessments, and certification practice exams, all when you use the promo code CyberWork on signup. That's infosecinstitute.com slash skills. And now let's begin the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Kelly Conlin is a security solutions specialist at Jamf focused on helping organizations to be more secure with Apple. Prior to joining Jamf, Kelly was an intelligence agent in the U.S. Air Force supporting special operations before starting an IT career path. Kelly currently lives in Tampa, Florida with her husband, son, two cats, and a miserable husky. And (laughs) that is a mood for 2020. Uh, Our topic today is the specific security issues around Apple's platform and Apple products. Uh, Even lay people without a lot of security background know to some degree that Apple seems built just to a different sort of schematic than Linux or other OSs. Uh, And as you would imagine, this comes with uh, variance in security remedies as well as specific and inherent security issues. So today we're going to talk about uh, what Apple's security framework is like, what security issues you should be on the lookout for with Apple products, and what you need to do uh, know if you want to learn about securing Apple products and systems, especially in a career role. Uh, Kelly, welcome to CyberWork. Thanks for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, so let's start out with your background here. Uh, you said uh, you know that's uh, you, that you started out in the uh, in, as intelligence analyst in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Air Force uh, before starting an IT career path. Can you talk about? sort of your, your tech, uh, you know, hero's journey? Uh, like how yeah. far back does it, does it go back with you? Or were you a, you know, computer programmer as a kid? Did you find it sort of later in life? Um, I mean, always, I, I instinctively picked up to computers when I was mm-hmm. younger. Um, I mean, we had one of the old, like weird beige, uh, like compacts growing up that okay. my mom never could use, but I always was like internal home IT um, from right. a very young age. And uh, once I got into high school, um, the, I was, I'm very lucky that the school I went to had um, a lot of different avenues for like creatives. And so mm-hmm. I got into, um, I want to say AV because there's not like a proper um, label to it, but it was like our school's uh, like announcement program. Like we did the school news, but mm-hmm. it was all like video editing and videography mm-hmm. and photography. And so that's actually where I got introduced to Max. Um, was using in that program using video editing software. Um, And then I became a Mac hobbyist because it wasn't always in schools. Um, It was my personal computers, obviously like at work, they didn't really come across a lot of Macs uh, then. And yeah, so computers have always just been a huge interest. Macs were always just my personal choice. And then I uh, joined the Air Force. I had all this like photography and like video background and they're mm-hmm. like, hey, you would be really good as an imagery analyst when I go to the oh. recruiter. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, sure. Imagery analyst. That sounds fun. No, that's not what it was. <laughs> um, I don't know I actually- that term. What, 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 is, what does that entail? So essentially, um, it's a part of the intelligence community and intelligence um, kind of gathering uh, structure. And that particular method of um, intelligence is just analyzing what you can see um, Mm -hmm. and reporting back off that. So in modern times, um, that position and what I did for the Air Force was all drone work, um, satellite imagery analysis, um, right? Monitoring videos from drones, um, doing that kind of reporting. And I mean, it was amazing. It sounds very Jack Ryan, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like (laughs) explain it. Um, And I mean, there's times there it was super cool and uh, I was always in a classified space because it was Intel and uh, I just missed, I wanted to work on computers, right? Like I was using computers as an analyst and uh, I've just was magnetically drawn to like, I I just want to support this. Like I was constantly bothering IT because I would write a script that would make it so my computer couldn't lock me out. Uh, And I was just kind of a pain. 
Um, and so eventually I decided to make that switch. Um, and for DOD, if you want to work in Intel, a lot of the times they just need a lot of certs um, okay. or requ require certain certs. So I got CompTIA Security Plus yep. um, at, at the jump. Um, so I could work on classified systems. And then it just kind of dovetailed from there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Let's 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 sort of talk about your role now as a mm -hmm. security solution specialist at Jamf. Uh, what is what does your average day look like? So, like, do you have a, a a pretty like you know this two hours of the day I do this, this two hours, or is it sort of different every day? Uh, what are your primary roles and responsibilities? Things like that. So it's definitely different every day. Um, pacing can be very pretty dramatically. Um, the the role that I am in is a technical resource um, for new customers. Um, I'm not on the internal Jamf information security team. So I'm not actually looking at like our employees um, machines data or like telemetry from security events on their devices. Um, I'm more focused on how our customers can have a better security, increase our security posture overall with Jamf's products okay. um, and just kind of explaining that. Okay. So you're working sort of case by case with each, yep, each new exactly. incoming customer and yeah. And so you're sort of tailoring it to their specific security needs. Is that? Yeah, exactly. Just kind of being that translation, um, telling them, okay, well, that's your, that's your need. This is how Jamf can help with that. Um, I also work a lot with our marketing teams, um, coming up with blog posts, hosting webinars, as well as working really closely with our internal developers, giving them that feedback that I'm hearing from customers, um, security concerns, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, do you, keep regular hours? Or are you kind of on call all the time? Um, so I've always been remote since mm -hmm. I've been with Jamf. And okay. this was my first um, at home position. And mm -hmm. so I was at, at the, the beginning, um, I'm, I was always available. I had um, our communicator on our my phone, um, answered emails before I went to bed. Um, and I've slowly like loosened that. I mean, it is hard because I like to be responsive. I like to help. And so um, trying to turn that off. So I don't really have like set hours. I am kind of always available. Um, so it's just kind of a day by day thing. Yeah, but that's, that's not necessarily the parameters of the exactly. job position. That's, yeah. that's, that's you talking. Okay. It, yeah, it, that's a personal choice. <laughs> okay, got it, got yeah. it. Um, okay, so, uh, and, and I guess uh, sort of winding back from that in terms of, uh, you know, your skill sets, you've talked about a little bit about, you know, you got security plus and what, and where you sort of got started with things, but like, what were the sort of skill sets and things that you knew that, uh, you know, made you a good fit for Jamf? Like if people wanted to do the kind of work that you do, like what were the things that Jamf were looking for in terms of this role? So I started as at Jamf um, in a position called a systems engineer okay. or a sales engineer. So mm -hmm. I um, presented our products to, um, new customers or interested customers from a technical level. And um, I was a Jamf customer before I came to Jamf. So I worked at a company that was a full Mac shop and we used Jamf Pro to manage our Macs and our iPads. Um, so I was very familiar with Jamf as a company because I was purchased from them. Okay. And um, I, Jamf was, just became a goal of a company I wanted to work at. Oh, okay. I loved their yeah. product. You specifically, um, we're going after them. That's great. Yeah. I, I really wanted to work there and I actually applied a couple of times, um, and didn't get, didn't get the positions and then finally was able to move in, um, as a systems engineer. And then when we, um, purchased the company, Digita Security and created the, our security tool, Jamf Protect, mm -hmm. I, um, was kind of, they knew my background um, and I was very quick to pick up the product. I was very excited about it. Um, and then when we had this position open up, I was very eager to apply and um, kind of step into that role. Okay. Um, so uh, as we mentioned at the start of the show, today's episode is all about all things Apple. We've been talking about Apple. Mm -hmm. You're an Apple uh, evangelist from a long way back. So to, <laughs> so to start right at the very bottom here, uh, at the very beginning, how does Apple's OS differ structurally from PC and Linux in terms of like a security perspective? You know, I know I, I feel like Apple has the reputation and has for a long time of being kind of, you know, the, the interface for everybody, you know, it's like all, all the stuff is here. You don't need to know coding or even right. the perception of coding and things like that. So 
um, you know, how does an interface like that come about and, and, and so forth? I, so, um, obviously I don't work for Apple and I don't mm -hmm. know <laughs> their business minds. Yeah, no, no. What's their recipe? Yeah, tell me. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the focus that Apple has always had on the user is mm -hmm. one of the big key differences between them because they've kept such a control on software and hardware so they can control that user experience and um, that kind of expectation of what the user has because they've kind of cut out that variable of multiple hardware vendors right for their software um like like you get on the windows side and so i think that's the big key difference is that they've kept a hold of that they produce their hardware they produce their software okay um so they can keep that focus on the end user and i think that's why a lot of people um i don't i don't know if this is like the right term but kind of drink that apple kool-aid um yeah. because they feel so like appreciated um right like this computer gets me i get this i can pick this up quick and yep. they feel natural they've, yeah they've made it very easy to adopt um the their products yeah yeah do you get a sense i, I mean this is a total tangent but i feel yeah. like there there are you know like it sounds like you were kind of an apple family like i feel like like it's sort of like <laughs> computer preferences seem to go by family like i was a pc family my wife's family was an apple family like across yeah. the board and and like sort of straying from that would be sort of like almost sort of like uh, you know a dis dishonor to the family or something right like it's that. like pepsi or coke yeah, right like yeah, you, you, right. if your mom drinks diet coke you can't all of a sudden bring in a two liter of pepsi yeah no exactly you're working across um, purposes there i am the oddball of the family so okay. my mom is not you are in <laughs> I a pray house she divided. doesn't list this she's okay. not the most technical person hmm. um she got iphones when iphones became a thing and were cool and the hot new hotness right, right. um but she was never a Mac user. I I have old um, like iMacs that mm -hmm. I've used for testing or that I've just like taken apart. Um, and she constantly asks me for it. Like she's okay. like, you just have it sitting in your office. I want that. And I'm like, you don't like, this is not the computer you are used to. I would no. have to like retrain your brain. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I used Macs at school in mm -hmm. video editing and then okay. i just like fell in love and begged her and begged her like please i need a i need an apple computer i need the apple right. machine and okay um finally broke her down so nice um so for uh, the, the uh, this might be a perception issue and mm -hmm. you can feel free to sort of like pop the balloon but for those of us that are old enough for, to remember when when apple you know sort of first became the player on the scene i feel like there was a, a long time where apple products were perceived you know whether right or wrong as as quote unquote safer than pcs and windows uh because as i heard it most viruses and attack software were designed for pc and as such apple seemed safer by virtue of being hidden slightly in the background and obviously that's not the case anymore um but speaking to that was apple truly safer at one time and how does the relative security posture of apple now vary from uh, Windows systems in the present day? Um, so that's so hard to, I, I, I won. Okay. I blame Jamf a little bit for um, the, the, how Apple's um, or just Macs in particular, their, um, they, them as a target for security threats has kind of grown. And I think that's because there are solutions like Jamf Pro that allow it easy, to be easier for an organization to manage Macs, mm -hmm. right? Where that's always just been a PC thing. Like if, when you're at work, it was a PC of some variation. Yes. And um, because PCs were so dominant in enterprises and organizations, hospitals and schools, they're an easy target. These are so many of them, right? It's like shooting fish, not shooting fish in a barrel. That's a bad, oh wait, no. Yeah, there's more fish in the barrel. That's what that means. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's more targets. <laughs> shooting um, a barrel full of lots of fish. Yeah. It, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, um, you're gonna hit something. Exactly, yeah. They're, they were an easier target. And, and so I don't necessarily think that it was easier to attack a PC from like a functional level than it was to right. attack a Mac. Um, I think it's just, it was based off numbers and now mm. those numbers are starting to get a little closer. And it, and also people, perf a lot of people use Macs from like the individual consumer, right? Like at home. Um, so if you're trying to an attack an individual, you can have a better chance if you know their, their system and, and that kind of stance. Okay. So I don't think they were always 
safer, right, than than the yeah. PC from like a technical standpoint. I I mean, I don't know. There there's so many different ways to kind of argue that point because yeah. like from a hardware perspective, because there are so many variables in vendors, um, there could be different um like physical security risks because of the hardware differences where the Mac, that hardware was always really controlled. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it just comes down to like your interpretation of security. Yeah. But I think they are more on an even uh, playing field and, and they sure. definitely have a similar landscape now for sure. Yeah. I, th I think it was, it was not so much like attacks, like in terms of hackers, but I just feel like I remember hearing that like viruses were, customized right. so much to PCs that exactly you know people who are like well you know it's not going to necessarily come through my email because it's not really Mac specific right. but I feel like at this point there's just a lot of everything right yeah exactly 100 mm -hmm. percent okay um can you speak at all to this is some, something that you know we had a we had a suggestion from someone in in staff here uh, I think they heard it on a podcast somewhere <laughs> um but uh speaking of Apple's um you know system across multiple types of devices, you know, it's, it's on, on one hand, it makes things easier to protect, but it also means that zero day attacks can be, you know, more pervasively destructive as they cover sort of thousands of times the surface area that a target attack might otherwise have. You have. And I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm getting that right, but is there sort of like a uniformity of like, um, you know, Apple's structure or whatever that makes zero days especially vulnerable? Um, so... Apple doesn't have the same operating system across all the devices. There's okay. Mac OS, there's iPad OS, there's iOS, okay. there's TV OS, watch OS. Mm -hmm. uh, each device does have its own separated oper separated operating system. Um, but Apple is taking approaches to make that more uniform, um, right. allowing okay. to be able to pick something up from your phone and then be able to pick it back up on your Mac or on your iPad. Um, so they are allowing that kind of cross uh, use against the different operating systems. They are making that more like uniform. Mm. And so I don't know, I, I could totally see what the potential risks there, um, especially as apps made for iPads or iOS devices um, being added to the app store and being available on a Mac. Um, because even though Apple is pretty strict on their developers and what they allow in the app store, we, I mean, they just had a case recently where they actually notarized Mac malware to be able to be downloaded. Yeah. Notarization was one of their big um, kind of security approaches to help only allow things that are authorized and kind of right. been blessed off. So they're not in, there it's there's no perfect defense um right like you have to be aware of everything there's always things that are going to possibly slip in so i do see that there could be potential risk with that for sure okay um yeah so so speaking to that uh, you know it, it sounds like it's pretty hard is it is it pretty hard to sort of get one over uh, you know via the app store in that way that you know they were able to authorize this thing was so what happened with that was it just that it looked very very realistic and just sort of didn't it pass the sniff test or something yeah exactly um mm. and then it just turned out to be malware um, okay okay and that but that's <laughs> yeah. that's that's not a common case no and and that's the first i've heard of there may have mm. been more but that was the okay. first that was kind of like publicly made that was a big knowledge yeah okay. yeah it's like ooh, ooh. Yeah. Okay, so we mostly want to talk, obviously, you're, you're a bit of a Mac guru here and a Mac mm -hmm. enthusiast. We want to talk about Mac-specific um, security risks that people should yeah. be aware of. Like, what are some, some common errors, first of all, that are made by Apple users, you know, just out in the world that open them up to big security risks? Uh, being careful what you click on. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that goes across any user of a computer, sure. not yeah. just Mac-specific. Um, but, yeah, just being cautious of what you click on. Apple does a really good job of trying to put in some protections to the end user. Um, so not disabling things in the operating system, right? So like if you go to Stack Exchange looking for how to, hey, how do I do this really cool thing on my Mac? And then they recommend that you disable internal protections. Like right. you shouldn't do that. Like just because <laughs> some dude on the internet told you to. Yes, right. um, not worth it. Yeah, exactly. And like there's always those targeted tools that are like, let's clean up your Mac, your Macs, like here's your pop-up, right? That, yeah. I mean, that, that, that happens a lot on the Mac side because they are very focused on like your Mac is contaminated. You need to download this yep. um, kind of thing. So I think there's always that risk. Um, and depending on the type of attack and uh, what, 
<laughs> what the attackers like motives are is there's always that like sense of urgency, right? Like you need to do this right now because yeah. you're, um, yeah, you're, so you're like, short circuiting their common sense. It's like, yeah, right before I can think about it, just do it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just have to kind of take a step back, right? Like, is this really, <laughs> is something bad? Um, but that's hard. I think yeah. there's, there's always that pressure, um, as a user to just be aware. Um, but people like Max because it's easy to use. They don't need to right. know all the ins and outs of everything. Um, like people don't know where their launch daemons and launch engines are at and that there may be potential persistent tool there. Um, so I think it's just keeping being patient, being weary of things that they download and click on, um, keep the native security functionality that Apple gives you enabled, don't right. turn it off, um, and just be more investigative. Gative mm -hmm. in, into what they wanting to add, I think would be my biggest, like just for yeah. any, any end user. Yeah. It's a pretty solid, I mean, you, you know, there's always that sort of, you know, balance between sort of putting it all on security awareness. It's like, well, if exactly. you hadn't, if you hadn't thought of, you know, if you, if you hadn't clicked that pizza coupon is we wouldn't be here versus the sort of like really restrictive endpoint thing of like, you can't click on anything without five authorizations, you know? So there's, yeah, there's gotta be a balance in there somewhere. Yeah, and I think because of my military background and like specifically working in Intel, I I am naturally more of a paranoid person. I don't yeah. think I am, but I guess I am. And I it's just I think of the same thing like just because somebody tells you, hey, you should leave your front door open um, because it's going to make your house so much cooler all day. Like you're not going <laughs> to leave your front door like wide open and right. just let anybody in. Um, it's just the same thing. Like don't just download this tool because they're like, hey – your memory is all used up. We can help you there. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, that check. also sort of speaks to uh, just what people actually do with their computers in terms yeah. of, I, I just use it as a tool versus like, I actually understand the sort of behind meanings. Like, you know, you, you would never sort of blame, you know, your house. Well, I just, I just live here. It's not like I actually know enough not to lock my door in the front, exactly. you know, but a lot of people can, can sort of give that excuse of right. like, I'm, I'm just wanted to write email to my grandkids, you know, how, yeah, how, how was I supposed to know? So, yeah. so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on sort of like ways to get that kind of baseline sort of tech knowledge to people who are just using, you know, uh, you know, what's, what's known as the easiest, you know, interface in, in right. a possible way. Um, so I think Apple does a really good job of, they don't tell the end user, hey, you need to know this. They have those kind of protections in place, but they're silent. Like you're not going to get a ton of pop-ups because like, hey, we completed a scan. Everything's good. Like right. the, it, yeah, Apple everything, has- Everything kind of updates behind the scenes while you're exactly, sleeping. Exactly. Yeah. Right. They kind of want it to be easy to use. They want their kind of yeah. um, taking ownership of like, let's make it the best um, end- allow for the end user to have the best experience and like so um yeah mm -hmm. so um you know speaking uh in you know we, we start with the sort of in individual level here but you know mm -hmm. obviously most offices uh even before the pandemic were were mixed use in terms of who was using what operating system and and you know are even more so now that people are working from home you know maybe some of them are using a work computer and maybe a little bit of their own devices in the evenings and stuff like that. So uh, what are the differences in trying to secure window devices versus Macs or Linux? Um, I, so some of, I mean, the biggest differences are the different types of attacks, mm -hmm. right? Or just being aware of the different types of attacks and what those different methods look like. Um, I know that having like uniform protection across like all of the devices you manage seems like it would be the like solid thing and like the right answer but you need to make sure that like whatever you're doing to secure your device is like specific to that device right like mm -hmm. you're the um like with a mac um putting in certain like root um, kind of permissions and ensuring like the end users don't have access from an administrative level to modify things that they shouldn't be doing is just as important as doing that from the Windows side, but they're mm -hmm. done differently. Um, so it's understanding how they differ and mapping that out. Like you can't, I don't think there's one um, like device hardening plan that you could have as an, like as an organization that would fit everything from Windows to the Macs. Mm -hmm. um, I do think you have to kind of go through and really understand the the differences in those operating systems. Do you have any sort of thoughts on how this, you know, this sort of 
non-uniformity of, of, of devices should be dealt with at an IT level in terms of like making this kind of hardening plan? Um, I, so personally, I think, it, well, okay, so my IT background started in secure facilities, right? So we didn't have like dedicated like InfoSec like built out teams. Like it wasn't like, here's your InfoSec department, here's your IT department. Right. Like we were already working on devices that were so heavily secured that like IT was InfoSec kind of a structure. Okay. Right. Um, so moving from DOD and like federal government to like commercial spaces, that's when, been one thing that I've been kind of shocked by is that there is such a a lot of the times there's such a departmental like harsh line on infosec and it and i think when it comes to device management from the it level and policies that infosec are putting in play i think they need to be closer than they are um i think instead of infosec being like hey you need to go enforce all these settings IT should be able to have a say and say like, well, if we do that, the end user is going to, they're going to be mad and they're going to just turn that off or they're going to constantly put in tickets. Um, Yeah. I, and so I would love to see a world where those two teams are, have a closer relationship just naturally. There isn't that separation. Um, And just uh, like, yeah, more kind of cross um, that line needs to blur, especially with everything being mobile. Um, yes. nowadays, right? Like yeah. it, you've got to be prepared for that. Well, that's, that jumps perfectly into my next question here. Cause obviously <laughs> you, you mentioned, uh, you know, that you, you are very much a, you know, still checking your email just before bed and yep. all, all hours of the day. So as the notion of the fixed day work gets more amorphous and employees work on projects at different points in the day from a wide range of devices, uh, do you have any sort of safety tips to keep you from compromising your company's valuable files? Even if you plan on say working on some spreadsheets while you're watching TV? Yeah, so this is this is hard, and Apple has made it hard harder because they have that um, cross platform like use, mm-hmm. and I can log into my iPhone with my iCloud information, and I can log on to my work computer with my iCloud information, and all of that is cross transferred. Um, so I think it is. I the the first step I would take is make sure end users understand acceptable use policy. Um, right. Like if they have a work machine, what are they allowed and not allowed to do on that work machine? What personal things can they handle there as well as like on their mobile devices? Like if you expect me to have, um, email on my mobile device, are there things I'm not allowed to have on my device because Mm. emails there? Um, I think there's, there needs to be a lot more education, um, to employees and staff on on acceptable use instead of just a super dry 10 page contract in your employee handbook where people just sign it. I think there needs to be clear um, boundaries there. Um, And I am personally like my my phone is my most personal device that I could have, right? Like my banking information is there, my family's photos, um, my routes that I take, right? Like when I go for a run, I log on my routes. So right. if somebody wanted to attack me and they wanted to do it when I'm lone and vulnerable, right. all they could need to do is get access to my yeah. like route plans, right? For my workouts. So um, I, I acceptable use is the big one there. Like really defining out what you're okay with from your end users um, and where that bleed of personal and work is allowed to cross. Without, you know, um, uh, going into, I guess maybe going into specifics, but like, how do you secure, what, what, what are your steps for your phone? Cause I think a lot of us mm-hmm. have that back of head feeling like, oh, I probably should be more secure on, on my mobile devices. Like what, what, what do you do to give you the sort of peace of mind to, to go running and, and not worry about your, your schedule being hackable? Uh, I, I do two factor for everything. Okay. Um, I don't do the same password. I, I love Apple's um, random password suggestion tool that they have when you're yep. creating new accounts. Um, I've slowly started moving into the um, like Apple account that they have been out- announced. I think it was last year at their developer conference where you can now sign in with Apple um, when like creating new apps. So I've okay. tried to like migrate to that because they don't share your email address. Um, and and I do a lot of research on apps and software that I use on like, what do they, what of my data are they going to publish? Where mm-hmm. is that going to get sent? Right. Um, I, 
so a big part of the Intel piece that I did was location data. Um, so I'm more cautious on like location information. Like I don't tag, like I'm at this place on right. like Instagram. Yeah. Um, those, I try and avoid that as much as possible. I am not some like celebrity where people are going to be like, Oh, she's at Starbucks on 54th yeah. street. Let's, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't have to have that concern, but I do think there's a lot of people that do have that, um, kind of draw to them or if people are wanting to know where you are at um, yeah. because of what they're putting out on social media, it is easy to find. Right. Um, so like I use the, the running app I use is not a community facing one. So like my routes are not published to a community for people to give me kudos. Right. I don't want that out there like that because there's a ton of applications that do that um, and people yeah. don't realize what they're, what they're giving out. So again, I'm just more, hmm. more paranoid than yeah. the average person. I think, that, um, I think that's worthwhile. Yeah. yeah, no, there is definitely that feeling yeah. of, uh, you know, yeah. Catch me at, you know, the Seven Eleven here or whatever. Exactly. I, I also it. listen to a lot of true crime. I'm a big, yeah. true, I've always been a big true crime fan. So I've oh, always yeah. got that like caution behind yeah. me oh the more of that you listen to especially from the 70s you're just amazed yeah. at people and their windows exactly. and their doors and they're nothing mm -hmm. yeah who sits with all. their window open all night yeah, on the sure, first why not? floor what's, what's the worst that could happen crazy people <laughs> um so um you know to uh for listeners who are maybe trying to break into cybersecurity, we have a, you know a lot of listeners who are just sort of considering security as a as a you know a, st a stepping stone or a first step um you know obviously there's there's some uh, other platforms that have specific certifications. There's Linux Plus. There's MCHE. Mm -hmm. I, is there a, is there an Apple specific certification? And if not, what what do you go about? Like, what do you study to sort of like study Apple security? So, I the only like Apple certification from a security level that I've seen is I want to say it's a company called Black Bag. Mm. I I think that's the name of it. No, yeah, Black Bag Tech. They okay. have an Apple forensics course. Oh, so investigating okay. Apple from yep. more on like the analyst side of things. Sure. Um, that's one of the first ones I've seen that's been focused on Apple covering iOS and Mac OS. Uh, but yeah, there isn't a ton. I mean, there's certifications for being Apple administrators. Jamf mm -hmm. has a few that we offer, okay. um, but not a ton like that's focused on security. Yeah. One thing that I don't think a ton of people know is Apple produces a platform security guide that's mm. made available to the public. Um, they update it every OS or just changes. I and did, it is I did a, not know that. It's a beautiful document. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they really cover why they've taken these approaches, what enhancements they've done, and they get into like that technical um, deep. So if you're wanting to know more on Apple's just general security approach, that's such a great place to start. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing, you know, if you're, if you're learning to secure multiple different types of operating systems, you know, PCs, Apple's, Linux, uh, it might be kind of like trying to learn Spanish, Portuguese, and Catalan all at the same time. You know, there'd be a lot of similarities, but enough variances that you might be hard to kind of keep track of what goes where. So can you speak to learning about security issues uh, that vary between different types of OSs? Um, yes, I, I think understanding the fundamentals of what cybersecurity means, right? There's network um, security vulnerabilities, right? That that could affect multiple OSs, uh, social engineering tactics, um, what p potentials could happen to that end user. So I think starting with fundamentals is such a great place to begin, obviously. I mean, a lot of people don't even think about that. They're like, well, I want to be a Linux security admin. Right. I'm going to start here. And it's yep. like, I think you should take at least five steps back. Um, go through like just basic infosec practices. Um, just mm -hmm. get used to the terminology, get used to types of attack. Like people don't realize that like if when you say viruses and Trojans and ransomware and malware, like those can be interchangeable depending on the attack, depending on the um, kind of techniques that hacker is taken. And, and so I think start with the basics and then build that path from there. There's so much information out there and there's so many different ways to learn. I'm very hands-on. I have to like observe yep. somebody actually doing things for it to really set into me. And I have to do a lot of correlation. I have yep. to do, or not correlate, like association. Mm -hmm. um, like I have, like when I think of investigating a cyber threat, I think like a 
police officer, right? Yes. Like I have to build my evidence. I have to understand its storyline or yep. um, build out that timetable. And um, I think very much like that because I, I am a true crime fan and I yeah. put that, that association there. Cool. Um, so what, what um, as someone who's kind of come to this uh, through sort of a, a circuitous route, what, uh, what, what job or learning tips do you have for professionals that want to get into this type of field or these specific types of uh, security work? Uh, are there any particular job titles to aspire to if you want to work on security at this level? Um, I, I would recommend, so I didn't take a traditional path <laughs> um, mm-hmm. to, to be in a security right. role. Um, I love the idea of starting out as like an analyst, um, working in a SOC, um, actually seeing data as it's flowing through, getting your hands like dirty in in data, um, I think is super helpful. And there's just, there's so many routes you can take. Like you can be a SOC analyst, you can work on the developer side, work for a company making security software and be like a an engineer or um, build Python scripts for testing companies. Um, The cybersecurity world is just so big Mm -hmm. and there's so many chances there. Um, I mean, I still don't hundred percent know what I want to do when I grow up and like where, (laughs) where that's that's going to leave me. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But like, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's come, I mean, most companies have a C-suite level position that is in charge of security, information security, or security as a whole and physical. Um, So I think starting from the analysis level, because you're going to see the data, that telemetry, I think would be really helpful. Um, And and there's so much information out there. There's so many blogs. Uh, Actually, speaking of like Mac specific or Apple Mm -hmm. specific, um, two really great blogs that I would love to just plug our um, objective C, which is Patrick Wardle's blog. He is a Jamf employee, but he is this crazy Mac security genius. Um, He has some great free tools that he's built. He, I mean, he blogs all new Mac threats as they come available. Really amazing, amazing uh, tool. Just his blog alone, just a knowledge source is awesome. And then also um, the blog called the Mitten Mac Hmm. Uh, it's all on like Apple forensics or well, just Mac forensics and, and understanding um, that security side of things. Okay. Uh, so as we sort of wrap up and we start moving into the speculative area of things based on, on current business practices at Apple, do you have any thoughts on what future security issues might, where they might be coming from? I know that there were some, some ads uh, on some NFL games recently where Apple was stressing user privacy. And so mm-hmm. whether there is or not, they, they definitely see a, like a perception issue in terms of how people view their privacy and things. Do you have any, I know that's not necessarily for you to speak about, but do you have any yeah. thoughts in the directions of security and privacy issues in the coming years? Um, so, okay. I personally have very um, different opinions because I've worked as an analyst analyzing data, mm-hmm. right? The more data you have, the easier analysis is, the, the easier you can build your um, your like assumption. You can make facts out of different pieces of data because you can build out a full story. So I love the idea of having access to data, but then I'm, I think from a personal level, do I want everybody to know all of that about me? Like, heck no. Yes. Um, and, and I think a lot of people don't realize what like cyber or just data privacy really truly means and like, oh, well, I'm just so-and-so living in Iowa. They don't really care about me. Of course they can just have all my information. Um, but there, you don't really know what that could lead to, how that can be affected. And there's a lot of great uses to user data as well. Like it's such a, such a fine line, um, like from a marketing perspective, making yeah. it easier for you to find things that, oh, you really like this. You'll also really love this, right. Right. Um, that, that kind of thing. And I, so I respect Apple's approach, um, like on the Windows side, like with Windows 10, like I don't think people realized how much of their data was being able to be extracted, right. like all their Cortana usage, yep. like all of that was just turned on by default. And I don't think people were aware of how much of that information could have gotten. It's a whole other labyrinth. Yeah, exactly. Um, So I don't know what that's going to look like. I think there's going to be a lot more focus on Apple security. I think there's going to be a lot of people who want to get those gotcha moments, right? Like I took advantage of it. This is, I was able to hack Apple. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of attempts like that. Um, So I don't, I don't know where it's going to be. I don't, 
it's such a hard question. I think yeah. Apple is definitely going to get bigger. There's going to be a lot more adoption for larger organizations um, yep. for sure coming coming in the next couple of years. So I think they're going to be a bigger player and they're going to have a bigger target for sure. Okay. Uh, so as we wrap up today, uh, tell us a little bit about Jamf and some of the projects and, and products that you're working on right now or things that you're excited about or want to talk about. Um, so Jamf is a Apple management uh, provider. We provide Apple management software. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's such a cool company. I love, I really, this is one of the first places that I've worked at that I'm like, these are my people. They get me. Um, it's a nice feeling. <laughs> and yeah, I love it. Um, and so our approach of helping organizations succeed with Apple, like that's the company like motto. It's so simple, but it's perfect. Like we just want you to have a better experience using Apple products in your organization, whether it's a school, a hospital, financial institutions, right? It, we want to have across the board, you have a good experience. And so with that, and as things have ch changed, we introduced Jamf Protect, which is our security solution. Okay. So um, I've been heavily focused on that and I love the possibilities of where it can go. Um, it, it's a very different approach to like third-party security software uh, because it we took the approach of what we thought would be as respectful to Apple as possible or just respectful to the OS, like what is already in the Mac OS and uh, what will work best with that. Um, but still give administrators and security teams the level of information that they need without impacting the end user, right? Like I said, we're not like going to have pop-ups like, oh, scan complete, you're all clear. Um, that's just not part of the our product um, yeah. because it's not something we thought Apple would do because that's not right. something they've done. Um, and when it comes to security software, I think it, uh, if an institution has more visibility, if they can see what's happening, they can kind of loosen the reins of restrictions, okay. right? right? Like if you have more insight and you know what's going on, then maybe you don't have to be so controlling um, sure. and push things down because you can have a little bit more peace of mind. Um, and I think yeah. that's something really unique that you get with Protect. Yeah, I think that's I think that's that's worth noting in terms of, like you said, uh, people. It, it just comes down to sort of perception of like I don't really know what's going on back there, so let's just turn all the protections yeah. on and right and and so you can you can be more more freed up if if you know someone else is at least minding the store. Exactly. Yeah. No. No trust because I I can't see it. So if I can't see it, I'm not going to trust it. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. So uh, last question for all the marbles. If people want to know more about Kelly Conlon or Jamf, where can they go online? So obviously Jamf.com. I'll talk about Jamf first because there's way more that is access That's to. Um, J-A-M-F for those J -A -M -F. of you. J-A-M-F. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, Very good. If you've ever had any question um, from a technical level on mm -hmm. Apple, if you've Googled anything, I guarantee you've probably come across a Jamf Nation post. Okay. Um, so Jamf Nation is our users community you don't even have to be a Jamf customer to be a part okay. of Jamf Nation. It's a Mac admins community. It is the coolest thing um, and such a big part of Jamf and why I wanted to come work at Jamf. Um, so definitely Jamf.com, we've got Jamf Nation and they've got, I think it's Jamf, oh, I'm going to get yelled at. I think it's Jamf Software on like Twitter and Instagram from okay. like a social media perspective. Cool. Um, I, I have social medias. I'm not, my my Twitter is like <laughs> retweeting yeah. real housewives and uh, sure. posting about maps and security. Yeah. So it's, okay. it's, a, no worries. it's a craziness, but I mean, I'm on LinkedIn would love to connect to people there and um, message them. Okay. K E L L I Conlon C O N L I N. Exactly. All right, Kelly, thank you for being our guest on cyber work today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This is a uh, podcast dream. I'm a big podcast fan. So this is oh, super fantastic. exciting. <laughs> That's great. We, we both, are, both of our dreams came true today then. <laughs> uh, thank you. And to all you listeners whose dreams came true as well, thank you for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in cyber work with InfoSec. Check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. So you can just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher of choice. Uh, and as ever, if you'd like a free month of our InfoSec skills platform, which includes uh, hundreds of cybersecurity classes and uh, evaluation exams and cyber ranges, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash skills, type in promo code Cyberwork, C-Y-B-E-R-W-R-K, no, no capital letters, 
and you get one free month. Thank you once again to Kelly Conlon and thank you all for watching and listening and we will speak to you next week. <laughs>